Jenna Fisher. And I'm Angela Kinsey. We were on The Office together. And we're best friends. And now we're doing the Ultimate Office Rewatch podcast just for you. Each week, we will break down an episode of The Office and give exclusive behind-the-scenes stories that only two people who were there can tell you. We're The Office Ladies. Welcome, everybody, to the email surveillance episode of Office Ladies. Howdy! It is Season 2, Episode 9, written by Jen Salata, directed by Paul Feig, and we have a special guest in the studio with us today. He played Bill, one of the members of Michael Scott's improv class. It is our friend, Ken Jong. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. We are so excited you are here. You are our second in-studio guest. Yes. Uh you and Creed Bratton, Ken. That is privileged company. It's so I'm good. very, very excited to be here. So seriously, thank you. And congrats. Congrats on the success of your podcast. I listen to it and it's it's awesome. So thank Thanks. you for having me. Thanks, Ken. And this is Ken's day off. And I mean, you're a busy, busy person. I can't even I can't even get into the mass singer and what oh. it what it means to my children oh. and how much right. we have to talk about it. That's right, a whole right. other subject. Sure, sure. But you're a busy guy and we appreciate you coming in on your day off. Oh, yes. No. Thank you. Before we get into this episode, you two have known each other for a very long time. When did you guys become friends? You did a movie together. I think really can what crystallized our friendship was your 40th birthday. Was it your 40th birthday? It was, it was my 40th birthday. Your 40th birthday. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> he's twisting in he, his chair. He right literally now. is about to fall out I of don't his chair. know this story. Okay. So, you know, Ken had done the office, but we didn't work together no. that day. Our paths never crossed. Right. And then years later, we're on hiatus from the office, and I am going to be playing this role on a movie called Furry Vengeance. Brooke Shields was in it. Yes. Brendan Fraser. I yep. was such a huge Brendan Fraser oh, fan. Me too. Oh, my gosh. We were filming in the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts. Day one. The, I think we were like two doors apart on our floor. Yeah, I know. We were on yeah. the same floor. Yeah. I think we're across from each other. We're across the hall. We're across the hall at the Radisson. Oh my gosh. I come out of my room. Ken comes out and I'm like, hey, you picked the Radisson too. We're we're the only two actors. Yeah. We're we're the (laughs) only two actors in the Radisson with the crew. Yeah. So we would we just would hang out all the time. We were always in the shuttle together. We became pretty fast friends right away. Very fast friends. And that first week was Ken's 40th birthday. And here he is away from his family. You were a little sad about it. Yeah. And we didn't have a car. Because we, <laughs> we, were, we were on location. We had the day off. Our day off happened to be his birthday together, him and I. I said, you know what? I'm going to take you out for your birthday. And from the Radisson, there was a – we were sort of up on a hill. And you could see <laughs> down the hill, down a big, steep hill in this parking lot was a P.F. Chang's. <laughs> And I said, I said, Ken, I'm taking you a PF Changs for your birthday. Amazing. Not wait, I don't know why we didn't want to get a cab, but we, I know we, why. Why? Why? That, that, you we, walked it. We walked it, yeah. and it, it wasn't like it was connected in the parking lot. At one point, we had to like crawl a little bit through a grassy median thing. Remember, it was like the parking lot was separated by like a little bit of a grassy knoll. Anyway, we walked down this parking lot. We go into PF Changs at like 11 a.m. There's no, there's there's like no one there. We're the first people there. We ate so much and drank a ton of beer, and we were both really buzzed. Yep. And now we have to walk up this hill, and we're like tipsy, and we're like, oh my god, this hill sucks on the way back. And Ken was like, what did you do to me? (laughs) My fortieth birthday. (laughs) Okay, what? You just decided mid walk, like, hey. I should just exercise. Yeah. And you're like walking around the parking lot like like, like you're doing I laps. I said, pump your arms, and then Ken. You li- we're literally speed walking drunk at a Radisson parking lot. Just remember, you're just, you're, I was like, there's Ken, a hill. Pump your arms. Come on, pump, pump your, your arms. arms. We're going to get a workout. And I was just crying laughing. You were crying laughing so hard. You were like, what are, what we, are we doing? doing? And you, you turned on, to Ken. me. Pump, pump, pump. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm taking us off topic. All right. Focus. Jenna, how about a summary? In this episode, Michael gains access to everyone's emails and discovers that Jim is hosting a barbecue. Everyone except Michael has been invited. Michael fumes, but Jim holds firm. After attending his weekly improvisation class, Michael crashes the barbecue after all, and Pam suspects Dwight and Angela might be a couple. Uh... Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Yes, this is a Big episode. This is a big episode. All right, fast fact number one. We always start with fast facts, Ken. Copy. Well, 
That's Jenna. Jenna loves a fast fact. Okay. Okay. So right. let's don't mess with them. No. You like my fast facts. I like them too, but I it's it's like you coined the phrase fast fact. Did I not? Ah! No. Did oh, I not? Joel McHale's flipping you off. Bad do, Joel. Do our listeners need some context? Bad Joel. This is Joe McHale, okay, my nemesis. Okay. So we are, on community. we are in one I, recording booth and the glass window you know is what? facing his. We can see him through the glass and, and is, he can see us and he is being offensive yes, and I, aggressive. He gave us the bird and Joe, then he mooned us. Now on. he's coming in. This is, no, on. now lock he's coming it. in. Lock it. I am here with friends, you can all right? Have my microphone I'm here with people who I love and adore. Here, this is guys, just my favorite Parks I, and Rec episode. This is this is the where, office, Joel. This is Chris not Pratt. No, this is the how, office. How dare you? This is a show that started it all. And as much as Angela and Jenna, our best friends, you and I, if we had a show, we would come, call ourselves Community Enemies because I didn't like you. I never liked you for six mm -hmm, seasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was over 100 episodes. We barely tolerated each other. And, uh, it's, and the antipathy has only grown in the last four years. That is true. And here's the thing. When we saved Ken's career. <laughs> Stop after, talking about saving my career. Guy, Stop it. Have you ever listened? Has, Stop it. Has he talked about Just how many? knock it off. When he's when you look at his. Knock it off. When you look at his filmography. This, uh -huh. Stop it. Hangover. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Hangover 2. How dare you? Um, Hangover 3. How, how dare about, you? How about, I'm sorry, but you're leaving Furry Vengeance. <laughs> That's a movie Angela and I did together we, right we, before Community. We I can't sat believe on, you're we, saying this on mic. <laughs> look, I'm here as a humble day player uh -huh. talking about how. I was Bill on like, email surveillance. I I want to go on record and say I really think Community Enemies is a great yeah, I, podcast. I'd idea. be a good that companion. Just, that just happened. That Will just you please happened. do a rewatch of Community with Joel and call We're, it Community <laughs> Enemies and, and just give each other. Yeah. For like an hour. That is. <laughs> Speaking of, I am a really big fan of Community, and I remember that we would meet up at all the NBC yes. events because yeah. we were on air at the same time. And you had such a funny group of people, and I loved the show. And I would be interested in hearing some behind the scenes banter about that. Yeah, no, it was it was huge because I think the premiere, I think the first two episodes, I think we we followed The Office just to survive on the air on NBC. Because, I mean, The Office, you know, Thursday nights NBC was the flagship show. And so when we found out that we would it would air after The Office, we were always, you know, that was that was like the anchor for us. And that it, it's, it's funny how you think certain shows like The Office has helped other shows and and then, you know, get on the air, stay on the air and then give actors like myself and unfortunately Joel, you know, a career. And yeah. that's been, you know, I'm grateful for mine, you know, but the fans should be um, regretting Joel. I'm looking at Joel. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> we will. We will. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna use that as our promo clip yeah. for this episode. Yes. <laughs> All right. So before we were so rudely I don't know. interrupted, I know thing. before Joel McHill came in and he trashed our desk. He, he literally he trashed. dumped over a cup of pins. He yeah. moved our. He moved our, our beverages coffee and our tea. Yeah. And I know. I was gonna discuss my fast facts. Yes. Fast fact number one. <laughs> This is the first episode from writer Jen Salata. I love Jen Salata. Now, she will go on to write fan favorites such as Beach Games and Benny Hanna Christmas and many more. She also directed several episodes, but this was her first episode as a writer, and we love Jen. One of my favorite memories of Jen, I think more than any other writer, is she would giggle she would get behind so the monitor, tickled. and she her shoulders would shake. It's not that it was easy to make her laugh. It was that she was ready to laugh. She was mm -hmm. ready to love what you were doing. Mindy was like that, too, I have to say. I just loved her energy on set. But I think that helps with the actors, right? Like, just give the performers the talent yes. more confidence, you know? Yeah. yeah. And yes. Jen, Jen is the type of person, because she's so earnest and sincere, that when she does laugh, it's like her whole body gives into it. It's just, <laughs> it's just a sweet, wonderful thing to witness. It really is. It really is. All right, fast fact number two. <laughs> Do it. See, they're fast and they're fast. Oh, my God. Unlike Slow Lie Joe McHale. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. 
All right, we have two big guest stars for this episode. The first is Omi Vadia, who plays the IT specialist Sadiq. Now, he is also the star of this Bollywood movie called Three Idiots. It was a huge smash hit. Like, he's just a gigantic star from this movie. And then he was also in our episode. And... Our other guest star, Ken Jong, who is in the room with us now. <laughs> well, well, Ken, I did not know you when you got the part on The Office. We met years later. Right, right. Can right. you tell us a little bit about how you got the part? I, I used to be a doctor. I used to be a physician. But I, I really, um, I was auditioning just like during, like after work or during lunch. And then Allison Jones just took a liking to me. And she got me an audition for The Office. And it was Keep in mind, I really had no screen credits, and she brought me straight into producers. I still remember it vividly. It was in 05, and I had read in front of Jen Salata and Paul Feig, the director of the episode. And and I was a huge fan of Paul's from Freaks and Geeks, so I was already just geeking out in the office. And I'm not saying it because you're my friends and because um, this is the office, ladies. It was my favorite show on TV. So, And i just a huge BBC office fan. So I, I just knew the show inside out. And so it was really one of the first times, maybe the first time ever, I was brought in for a producer's read, you know, with the director in the room. And... And it's funny now because a lot of it, it, a lot of people, and rightly so, attribute my acting as very over the top and very like on community, you know, very very just pushing it out. And it, it, it's very you know very ironic. Like really, I think my breakthrough role was playing something very understated and with just maybe two lines. And I would basically whisper every line and. I improvised a look to camera, even if it wasn't scripted. Nice. And I remember, I still remember where I go, like, he told me he couldn't say, but he, he has a gun. And I just looked straight down the barrel, and Paul Feig and Jen laughed so hard at this this tiny movement. That little choice. That Very little subtle, choice. Yeah. And I still remember, like, Paul could not stop laughing. And whenever I see Paul, we, we still talk about it. And it still, it, it, it's one of those things in an actor's life where sometimes, like, um, I've, I've forgotten years of working on community, probably because of Joel. And, <laughs> but I remember every single minute of my maybe three hours on the office. You know, it, it's just really, it's one of those things. And I'm sure you have that too in your careers of you just remember your first time and you just know. It, if it's not a watershed event, it's maybe your favorite event. And that's kind of what what The Office means to me. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. that. Wow. That's such a wonderful yeah. thing to share. I, I love that, Ken. Thank Very you. Very grateful. Well, I have some fan questions, if you don't mind oh, answering, no. about your time in the scene. Jason P. asked, once you started shooting the scenes, how much of the improv was actually improv? That That's a great question. To my memory, I remember we – shot it a few times as scripted just so we have it and then to see Steve Carell and actually I believe D Ryan who was also in that episode mm-hmm. was a second city you know colleague I, I knew D Ryan oh. from Improv Olympic and had performed with her in the Armando Diaz show Wow I knew D and Wyatt Snack was in that Wyatt scene Wyatt Snack biggest mm-hmm. stars Joe Nunez who I've known mm-hmm. And then also Michael Naughton, who led the improv yes. scene, who was played Chris. He's a I had done a sketch comedy show with him, like years ago. Get out. Yes. Okay. Wait. So, but did was there improv? After a couple of, I do remember after a couple of things where it was in the script, he was FBI agent Michael Scar. And like at, at, as soon as the end, when we sit down for the post mortem of the scene, <laughs> Steve goes. I'm sorry, but she was denying me in this whole scene. She was negating me this entire scene. And that was not in the script. And they kept arguing back. And she goes, you know what? At least I'm not Jim carrying all this. And, and he goes, thank you. And they just had this oh, whole I love that. back and forth exchange for literally two minutes. And then she storms out of the room, out of the class. And as if it was scripted, as, she, as soon as she had her back turned, Michael Scarn had the gun to the back of her, boom! <laughs> and I was like, this is like my first big guest star moment or co-star moment. I'm like, I've just never seen this level of genius in my life on a set. It, it was this improv on top of an improv, and 
that that right there I'll just never forget. So I have another fan question. This okay. is a weird one, but I have to say I noticed as well. Hannah Benson said I did notice. Literally everyone in the improv scene has pit stains. <laughs> Were they not allowed to have air conditioning? What? Was it real hot? Was it really there? hot? I mean, Steve, when you guys raise your yeah. hands, everyone has a pit stain. He has a huge one when he raises the his women. Hands. I know. Even the women who usually sweat Wait, less. Ken is like laughing so hard. I don't, rem- I don't remember any of that. Well, guys, you I can just, go back and look at the episode. I, I, when what? everyone in the improv class raises their hand, it is sweat city. It is a sweaty day. Hannah Benson and Angela and I all noticed. But you don't have a memory of it no, being terribly sh- warm in the no, room. No, we shot that in we shot that in the fall. And I just remember it was cold. It was. I just remember it was cold. I had to wear... Actually, that the wardrobe that I had on the show that was those were my own clothes. I and, believe that. Yeah, <laughs> I wore yeah. my own clothes in the pilot. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. We were we were a shoestring budget at this time. Yeah, I had my own. I had a I had a ski jacket on. That was my own jacket that I wore to set. I mean, everyone. I was such a greenhorn, just not knowing anything. I had even gelled my own hair. Like I just you did your own you came hair. Ready. I came ready. You showed up dressed. I came ready, ready to like shoot. Tootsie. You know, it was like <laughs> yeah. I had everything ready. Like it was. It was. Uh, I, I. I was so green. I was so green. I had no idea. What was it like doing that scene with Steve? It. It uh, to this day is just something I'll never forget because he was coming off the forty year old virgin and. I'd literally just watched him in a movie theater, you know, the previous month. And it, you know, so I'm I'm sharing a scene with the biggest star in comedy. You know, he really is a role model to me because he 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 is he really is just a professional, elegant, classy actor who ha- he has no weakness in his game and, you know, either on or off screen. So he's just someone that I just really look up to. That was so yeah. beautifully said. No, it yeah. really was. Oh I gosh. mean, he I, is a role. He's a role model to me too, because it kind of what you're talking about. Like you now in life, you are Steve Carell to other young actors who get paired with you. And I always remember. I look back on how Steve treated people, and I think that's how I want to be. If I'm ever in a position where I'm the Steve Carell of a moment, mm-hmm. like not Steve Carell, but within a moment. I, I want to behave like he did. I want to be generous and thoughtful and giving and warm and inviting of this actor who's brand new to the system. Yeah, I remember I remember talking to him. I had a, a short-lived sitcom on ABC for a couple of years that I created and wrote. And I asked I, – I had run into Steve somewhere, and I would asked him for advice. And he actually – he had said, you know, you can't go wrong with just leading by example. Just, hey, if you're not going to act difficult – and nobody's going to act difficult. And that's, I remember he told me that. And it was, yeah, and I remember th- thinking about that when, like you said, I had my, I had a moment. And and I, I remember thinking to myself, if I work hard, everyone else will work hard. Ken, thank you so much. Are you kidding? Thank you for, for coming in. Me. It, not really, Truly. thank you. Cheer, cheers this to you guys. Congrats on this. And So I just, generous of you to no. give us your time. No, it, it it the office was my favorite guest star appearance ever, and it's just uh, just it it really just helped jumpstart my career. So so thank you. Well, thank you. listen, we were not on Community, neither of us. But when you and Joel do Community Enemies, we will come yes, on. You guys Jenna, will be Jenna and EPs. I will, we'll just come you, in and we'll you'll just, be you'll be giving we'll, us notes. We'll hey, storm your room. You, yeah, you'll storm the room. Give us notes. Hey, maybe. Maybe a little bit of friendship could show up in this yeah. episode. <laughs> I'm just going to come in and flip off Joel and dump his pins on his lap. <laughs> Done. <laughs> we're, we're the anti-office. Yeah. Me and Joel. <laughs> this is all class, fun, dignity, and then me and Joel. Just like- you get, your, your intro can be, you know, we're going to give – each week we're going to watch an episode of Community and we're going to give you all the behind-the-scenes yeah. info and trivia that only two people who hate one another can yeah. – Yes. Tell you yes. and, cr- and really We're tell you all the fights, yeah, and all of the and do a deep dive, all of the tension, do a deep dive critiquing each other's performance <laughs> and performance and lot in life, apparently, and, and like personal, personal, personal choices, like not just physical professional attacks, yeah, physical yeah. attacks. I know. <laughs> um, all right, Kim, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you guys. We're gonna take a break and then we'll be back to break down the rest of this episode. Okay, we're back. We are back. 
thank you, Ken Jong, And not thank you, Joel McHale. Not thank you, Joel <laughs> McHale. If you're tracking, and maybe you are, I hope you are, that we did not do our third fast fact. We did not. And it's a special fast fact. It's special because Angela and I both found our journals. We found our journals that we wrote in after each episode, sometimes during an episode. Yeah. You guys, I have journaled for so long. I have, I found like in setting up my she shed, 12 journals. Oh my gosh. I had Angela. so much to say. <laughs> I've been journaling since I could write. This I mean, I have BFFs. journals about my crushes in second grade. I found a journal from college that is like, I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> I'll tell you what, she was real hung up on a certain fella for a while. Whew. In this journal entry, <laughs> I wrote about this exact episode of The Office. Here's what I wrote. Here's a gem. <laughs> it rained for three days. <laughs> while we were shooting this episode. It takes five days to shoot an episode. And for three of the five days, it rained like downpour heavy rains, apparently. Torrential rain. I noted that our AD Richard had to wear a parka. He's the person who would knock on our trailer doors and get us to come from our trailers across the parking lot onto the stages. It was a little bit of a walk, you guys, and this parking lot would flood. There'd be huge puddles of yes. water. And I guess... It really caused a problem for hair, makeup, and wardrobe because we would get ready outside in our trailers, and then by the time we got to set, we were drenched. And I wrote all about it in my journal. I said that we had umbrellas. We each got an umbrella mm -hmm. with our name on it. Remember that? Yeah. They would give a little sticker so that we could keep I, track. I, I have to share with you that I often would misplace my umbrella, and I would just take someone else's. <laughs> Angela! And then I would hear Richard on the radio being like, um, has anyone seen um, John's umbrella? Uh, anyone? And I'd be like, eh, it might be in my trailer. <laughs> I also noted, speaking of John, that John's birthday was the week that we shot this episode. He turned 26. 26? Yeah. Oh, my Lord. That's so young. I know. Ugh. He and BJ and Mindy were all the youngsters. I don't know. Because the rest youngest. of us were all in our 30s and beyond, but they were still in their 20s. Wowzers. Okay, so I also wrote my journal. Now, I wrote about some things that happen at Jim's party and a few other places in the episode. I'm going to save those, Jenna. Okay. But I will tell you one thing I wrote about. Jenna, we carpooled to work this week. When we were shooting this episode? Yes, I wrote that we had to go on location. We were very excited because um, Jim's party, his barbecue, happened at his apartment. And we got to drive to location. And I wrote that you and I carpooled and we had the best time. I wrote, I was like, we chatted, we sang songs, and you know, we solved the world's problems. That's I what I wrote. I do not remember that. <laughs> I don't remember it either, but we clearly had a great time. I love that you wrote that down because I'm sure we did do that because we lived really close. We lived really close and we were probably so excited that we had a commute. Like yeah. we, had a, we had to drive far. And I said it was a little bit of a drive. But the thing that really cracked me up is I said, we sang our hearts out and we solved the world's problems. We probably did. <laughs> what did we sing, Jenna? What did we sing? I'd love to know. I wish I knew. Sounds of Scranton. Oh, I hope we sang Sounds of Scranton. All right. So let's get into this episode now. We're going to start breaking it down. It starts with the cold open. Yes. So Sadiq is coming to fix an IT problem, right? And Michael looks out his window. He sees him coming. He panics because probably Michael has some growing and maturity to do <laughs> about how he perceives others. That's how I'm going to say it. That's a good way to put it. He has some maturing to do. So anyway, he freaks out. He wants to turn off the lights and have everyone hide. But do you remember how we couldn't get it coordinated, Jenna? Like, we we couldn't turn off the lights and like at the right time. Yes. People should know that in this scene, when Michael runs over to shut off the light switches, those light switches do not actually operate the lights. The lights are controlled by a grid and a guy yeah. who's in charge of them. <laughs> and so what they would do is they would have someone on a radio who would see when Steve hit the light switch, and then they would radio, go. Yeah. And then the lights, light hit the switch lights. guy yeah. would actually turn off the lights. Mm -hmm. But it didn't always work. So sometimes Steve would hit the switch, and the lights would just stay on. Or sometimes they would anticipate too quickly, and the lights would go off before he hit the switch. Again, this is one of those moments where I'm like, thank God we didn't have to do any car chases or explosions. Because it's so true. It seemed like the light switch was like really tricky for us. I have to ask you one thing. Okay, so Sadiq from IT is coming to help Michael, yeah. right? 
I just have to say this, Jenna, at one minute, 26 seconds, this actually like may, I, I thought about this for days What <laughs> after watching this episode. Michael says he tried to install the software himself, but it was password protected. Sadiq says that just means you have to enter your password. Does this mean that Sadiq didn't even have to come there? If Michael had just entered one, two, three, four, that was on the post-it note, had he just entered that, the software would have installed? I think that's what that means. So that is so, like, if you put that in perspective, Sadiq is probably like, this idiot, all he had to do was enter the password I put on a post-it note and taped to his desktop. (laughs) It also feels like something that could have been solved with a phone call. Yes. He yes, didn't, he he definitely did not need to come into the office and be subjected to Michael's no, cold open. No, oh my gosh! So, at one minute forty six seconds, mm-hmm. Dwight surprises Michael outside of his office. Right, he's yes. demanding to know why the IT guy yeah. is there, and of course, Michael doesn't want to tell him no. because it's going to be revealed that he's there to install software so that Michael can spy on everybody's emails. Well, I want you to look in the background of this scene. As Steve's coming out the door, he quickly shuts the door behind him. Mm -hmm. That's because Omi was not there on that day of filming. (laughs) So he had to quickly shut the door. Yeah, Steve has to shimmy out and then shut the door behind him so that you won't see that the office is actually empty. Oh, Mm -hmm. look at you with your little behind-the-scenes nugget. Yes. All right, at 2 minutes, 14 seconds, Dwight lists off what could possibly happen to Michael. So that he might take over the office. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Here are the things that could happen. Okay. Number one, brain aneurysm. Number two, getting hit by a car, a bus, or a train. Number three, poisoned, fall down a well, step on a mine. These are, these are like, Dwight has thought this out, you guys. This is what could happen. And he'd have to do an immediate takeover. Immediate takeover. And Michael has that great line where he says, you know what, Dwight? If I step on a mine in Scranton, Pennsylvania, you can have my job. (laughs) He's so annoyed. Yeah. So the next big scene is kind of in the bullpen Mm -hmm. when Oscar confronts Michael about spying on everyone's emails. He He, does it in front of everyone. I loved it whenever Oscar confronted Michael in front of everyone. And he does this throughout the series. And it's just some of my favorite moments of the show. He is able to take Michael to task like no one else. I think Stanley also does this from time to time. But Stanley is usually more under his breath, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's a little more... Mm -hmm. To the side about it. Yeah. In this scene, Steve does this never-ending robot bit. Oscar's trying to get a word out, and Steve just keeps doing the robot thing. I remember shooting that. So in the script, that was not supposed to go on for that long. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That was supposed to just be like a quick little thing, but Steve really dragged it out. And that was an example, I think, of some of his just brilliant comedic timing. I honestly think that Steve would drag things out like that to see when he could get all of us to break. And we would break. He did break in that. He was a little sadistic that way. He'd be like, oh, you haven't broken yet? How about this? Yeah. How about this? Kinsey, I see you going. (laughs) Like, he'd just keep going (laughs) until we fell apart. Well, right after this, then, we have the little aside. Well, the erasing begins, right? The erasing begins. And Dwight says to Angela... If you have any sensitive emails, they need to be deleted immediately. Mm -hmm. Pam overhears. She calls Jim over. She suspects that they might be a couple. This is the first moment where we call out that Dwight and Angela might be together. Well, the first moment that anyone in the office has any idea, right? Yes. Yeah. Fan question from Kelsey McGrath. Angela, when did Angela and Rain find out that they were love interests? I mean, I'm not sure if Rain had any heads up before I did, but I found out at the table read. Really? Yeah. When we sat down to read the script and, and Oscar- So no one warned you beforehand? No one warned me beforehand. I had no idea. And when we sat down at the table read and we read that their Birkenstocks were bumping, Yeah. right? I was like, huh? What? Well, I, mean, I remember there was an audible gasp in the room mm-hmm. when we read that. There were times when we would do these table reads where- People would be legitimately surprised by plot twists, and this was definitely one of them. This, when we found out Oscar was gay? Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, when we found out Jim and Pam were going to have a baby? Yes. I mean, there were these big moments, but 
I did not know. And I remember being like, oh, my God. And I, I definitely don't think a lot of the cast members knew because no. there were there were real reactions there. Yes. I also I know we're going back a little bit, but I love that Kevin says he has to delete a lot. A, a lot. lot. Gross, Kevin. What's going on over there? Pam has a talking head next. Oh, wait. Can I yeah. say one thing? Yeah. Jenna, just to go back to Jim and Pam's conversation about Dwight and Angela. Yeah. This happens at four minutes, 45 seconds. I want you guys to rewatch the scene. Pam is so grossed out. And so is Jim <laughs> at the idea of Dwight and Angela. They're like, ugh. I'm just like, come on. That, what is, what's wrong with that? Two people falling in love. Pam is like, ugh, I can't. Ugh. <laughs> We are a little over the top You're about so it. so grossed out by it. I was like, geez. <laughs> well, Pam then goes and has a talking head where she says directly to the documentary film crew, if you see anything, let me know. Oh, yeah. She's like all chummy with the documentary crew. She full on invites them to help. I think this is the first time we see this moment where someone in the show speaks directly to the character of the documentarian. Right. Who we never see. Right. But yeah. Yeah, I think that Pam and Jim probably are the two people that engage with them the most. I mean, Michael, because he's a showboat, you yeah. know? But it's like Pam knows them. That's what it felt like in that moment. Yeah, like they're kind of friends or something. Yeah. All right, so something else in Pam's talking head. At four minutes, 57 seconds, I'm tracking the mail cart now. This she is she is, you guys. She's become obsessed with the mail cart. <laughs> I'm tracking Casual Fridays and the mail cart, and I want you all to know that Meredith comes over to the mail cart behind me during my talking head. Thank I'm you. Applauding, the, I'm applauding Jonah's mail cart tracking. The mail cart got used. <laughs> and then at five minutes, 12 seconds, there's just this interaction between Pam and Dwight that I love. I actually love Pam and Dwight scenes. They're some of my favorite. Yeah. You are often so, like, just exasperated by him. And it's it's one of my favorite things you do as Pam. She comes up to him. Pam's on the case. She's very excited. Detective Pam. She's like, Dwight, so my friend is kind of, you know, into these two girls. And Dwight's like, nice. And your face is like, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> At five minutes, 41 seconds, we find out that Dwight, as a volunteer sheriff, goes through everyone's medical records. So... That's great. Gross. Gross, Dwight. <laughs> My gosh. All right, Jenna, I have a thing that I track, you know, it's called old tech. Oh, yeah. What's your old tech track? <laughs> Guys, I think we should just call this the We Tracked It episode. <laughs> we tracked it. We're on the case. We're on the case. Much like Pam, we're on the case. I love me some old tech. And at five minutes, 57 seconds, you see the Evite. And you see, it's like so outdated looking. If you yes. go to Evite now, it's like, it looks like the old Evites of that day and age, if you yes. will. This is the scene where Michael is discovering the Evite and he learns that Jim is having a barbecue at his house and he is not invited. He's not invited. He sees the list of people who are invited and he is sort of looking around. He's using his mouse, right? Yeah. And it all is so old looking. Super like, old graphic. Yeah. yeah. So next, Detective Pam walks up to Angela at the vending machine. Oh, you guys, this is like some of my favorite stuff. I also wrote about this in my journal. I wrote, you guys, Jenna and I have a scene together. We're so excited. We did get so excited when we had scenes together. We were horrible because then we would just laugh and be idiots once we were in the scene. And they would take forever and people would get like really tired of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But we were really excited <laughs> about this scene. We were. I ask Angela if she's bringing anyone to the party and Angela says no. Mm -mm. But then Angela buys an extra candy bar. Yeah. Two Baby Ruth bars. Evidence. Dun, dun, dun. Fan question. Michael and Kristen Mulligan want to know, why did you choose Baby Ruth for you and Dwight? Did you, Angela, the person, get to choose what the candy would be, or was it scripted? Usually, Phil Shea, our props guy, would give us a few options. And they were options that had been cleared. Because for legal reasons, you have to make sure you can use logos and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they probably gave us a few options. I actually love Baby Ruth bars. <laughs> So I guess I want, I'm sure I was like, ooh, Baby Ruth bar. And thank goodness, I guess Rain agreed because he had to eat one too. No kidding. Yeah. So uh, I think that's probably how it went down. I want to point out though, you guys, one of the things I love in this scene is that as Pam goes to pick something from the vending machine, I swat her hand away and I'm like, Amazing. excuse me. I love it whenever my character would just swat someone away. It's so dismissive. It just made me laugh. 
Pam was probably going to buy some of her chips. Her gross, smelly chips. Okay, also, Angela, in this scene, at 6 minutes, 47 seconds, there is a really great shot, as you're bending down to get the snacks, Mm -hmm. of your ponytail. I know it sounded like I was going to say something else. It's your ponytail. (laughs) There's a great shot of your ponytail. It's a family show, lady. I know. Yes. You've got, like, hair wrapped around my own hair. Yeah, describe it. Okay, this is a classic Kim Fairy thing where even the ponytails were amazing. She would pull my hair back in this sort of severe ponytail, but then she would leave a big chunk of it out and she would wrap it around the ponytail holder so it looks like my own hair is holding up the ponytail. It's very polished looking. I know. And it's very Angela Martin to do this. It's very, very Angela Martin to do it. But I used to joke with Kim. I would be like, how early does Angela get up? to do these elaborate braids. And also, is she an octopus? Like, how does she get back there? How many, does she have like a mirror behind her head? Like, what does her bathroom look like? How does she do this? I have done that ponytail to myself. You have? Because I thought it was so genius. It is not that difficult to pull off. Really? And it looks really good. Well, I am crap with my own hair. So you might have to give me a tutorial. Well, guys, You should check it out if you're looking to um, spruce up your ponytail. Six minutes, 47 seconds. Fancy pony. Fancy pony. Great ponytail. Well, you know the scene in the kitchen where Steve, as Michael, is eating a cup of noodles? Oh. And he's he's confronting the group. He's trying to get us to feel guilty and or invite him to this party that he's not been invited to. John and I had a massive massive laughing fit during this lunch scene. So much so, you can see I'm eating some yogurt. Mm -hmm. So much so that I snorted the yogurt up into my nose, (laughs) which is probably painful. It was a little burny, which then caused John to laugh so hard that he was crying. (laughs) And it it was just the two of us. The two of us we're having a moment where we could not get, you couldn't it get it back. You couldn't get it we back. We couldn't. I want. You I don't to, know how they had any usable takes. I want you to know, I went and watched the season two bloopers. Okay. You guys, they're on YouTube and it's really worth it. <laughs> Can you see us yes, losing it? There's bloopers of this scene and it is hilarious. I was cracking up watching you guys. And also Brian does break in one of them too, but it's mostly you and John breaking. But the the bloopers, the outtakes from this are fantastic. Oh my gosh. I have to watch those because I, that was just my memory. I just remembered when I saw the scene, how much John and I couldn't stop laughing. Okay. Well, look up season two, the office bloopers on YouTube because it's really funny. Also, did you notice that there is a community plate of Doritos yes, on, on the a, table? On a paper plate? What's what? the story there? I don't know. Someone bought Doritos, mm-hmm. put a paper plate in the middle of the table, and then put the Doritos on the plate for us all to eat. I, I eat some. John eats some. What is that? I, I think you guys just shared some Doritos. <laughs> yes, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that complicated. <laughs> Have you ever done that in an office? Like when you're eating lunch with people, you're like, hey guys, who wants to split some Doritos? Oh my gosh, Oscar and I shared snacks all the time, Jenna. We would get a bag of chips and we'd share and we would get little uh, paper cups and like split snacks into paper cups. We also like at least once a week would share a Coke. I can't tell you how many times I would walk over to my desk and Oscar would be like, there's half a Coke for you. I'd be like, thanks. And some chips. I think that I'm a person who always wants a full Coke and a full bag of chips. So I have not experienced this thing you're talking about. Well, Oscar. This sharing of snacks. Oscar Nunez and I shared snacks and sodas every single week. That is adorable. <laughs> That is adorable. In fact, sometimes I know I'm like going on and on about this. Sometimes one of us would get the Coke and start it, but the other wouldn't be ready. So we'd be like, I put the half Coke in the fridge for you. He'd be like, okay. (laughs) So we would know. We'd sort of hide it in the back. This is absolutely adorable. Meanwhile, I'm just over at my desk chugging my full Coke. Your full soda. I had a question for you about this scene. Okay. At seven minutes, 48 seconds, Pam says the professors would go to the parties. And Michael goes, yeah, they were the most fun. Jenna, how did you get through that line? I know you said you I were didn't. laughing a lot, but like. I that, didn't get through any line in that scene. That line would be so hard for me to say because it's coming off of him being so ridiculous. Also, the whole time he's eating those dang noodles. Ugh. So I just, it, it it was, I have to go back. I want to watch the deleted. I, well, what is it? The, the bloopers. bloopers. You got to watch the bloopers. 
At eight minutes, two seconds, you guys, we find out what Jim thinks are the three ingredients for a great party. Number one, three cases of imported beer. Number two, karaoke machine. Number three, do not invite Michael. Yeah. I mean, he's probably not wrong. (laughs) All right. At eight minutes, 25 seconds, the camera crew helps Pam. I know. The camera rushes over to her desk and indicates that she should look over to Dwight who she discovers is eating a Baby Ruth bar, the one that Angela bought. That's right. I have that you are in cahoots. In cahoots. Pam and the cameraman are in cahoots. So first, Pam takes the step of talking directly to the camera crew, and now the camera crew has gotten involved. This is a big deal. I'm surprised that we did this so early in the series when I was watching this. We're not that far in for us to be involving the crew like this. People should know that our camera operator was Randall Einhorn. He's Mm -hmm. also our DP. He went on to direct a bunch of episodes. Mm -hmm. And I had a really special relationship with Randall. And I remember filming the scene with him. He was really performing for me. He would come over and he'd have a big smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye. And he would motion over. He would give me a little thumbs up. Mm -hmm. So all this interaction was happening. I felt like we were really performing together. And he was playing the character of the camera person. So I just have really fond memories of working with Randall in general. When Pam would have really emotional scenes, sometimes I would look at him and he would be teared up. No, he's he's got a big heart and he wears it on his sleeve and we all got really attached to Randall. And I just think of him as sort of this very charming, blue-eyed Terminator. Yeah. (laughs) That's my, because you guys, you only ever see one of his eyeballs because the other (laughs) eyeball is looking through the little the eye lens. piece. Yeah. yeah. So you see this one blue eye emoting emotion. And yeah. you're like, aw, you're you're like the friendly Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> the friendly Terminator. <laughs> At nine minutes, 29 seconds, you guys. Oh, Jim, you just break my heart all the time. But he's trying to be sly. He's trying to do that thing where he figures out, is, is Roy going to come? But he's trying to play it cool. So he's like, yeah, I just, you know, I just need a head count. Yeah. Is yeah. Roy, Roy going to be there tonight? Yeah. I just... I, you know why? It's just because I need to know how many burgers to make. Yeah. I mean, this is the subtext, it's right? It's nothing else. It's not because I love you and I want you to be in my apartment without your fiance. Yeah. Wait, is he? Yeah, he's still your fiance. <laughs> he is. I know. It's hard to remember, right? <laughs> Fan question from Juan Martinez. Was Roy really unable to attend the party or did Pam ditch him so she could hang out with Jim? I don't yeah. think she ditched him and I don't think she lied to him. Yeah. I think Pam was just as excited that Roy couldn't attend as Jim is. Yeah, I think Roy probably has some dude hangout. He's very, he's kind of a dude dude, right? Yeah. And he probably has his thing. And also, Roy, Roy wouldn't want to go. I was going to say, the last thing Roy wants to do is hang out with any of the Dunder Mifflin employees. Yeah. He's sort of over it. They have to do enough of that probably for him. So he was, I think, happy to sit this one out. And Pam was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And so was Jim. I'm like totally making this up. But maybe Pam waited kind of till the last minute to tell Roy about the party Mm -hmm. so that it would be less likely that he could attend. Like, I could see her maybe doing that. And I could see her downplaying it like, oh, you know, I don't know. It's the thing I have to go to. Everyone's going. Yes. A hundred percent. It's going to be lame. You you know what? If you don't want to go, you don't have to. Yeah, it's fine. I'll go because I feel like I have to. But I don't want you to have to change your plan. I totally get it. If you don't want to go, it's okay. This is a hundred percent how that went down, (laughs) I believe. Yes. All right. So now everyone's trying to get out of the office and they're trying to avoid Michael because they all know he's not invited. So people are making up excuses Mm -hmm. to not hang out with him that night. And Angela, you have a great one. You say, Charity, bake, drive. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. My character's like horrible at lying. Horrible. Well, a lot of people wrote in to ask if our excuses were scripted or improvised. Angela, was yours scripted or improvised? Mine is a combo. So my scripted line was Charity, bake, drive. And then Michael's scripted line was liar. And then... Steve improvised, you are a liar. And then I improvised, no, I'm not, as I left. (laughs) And I didn't even look back. And it it stayed in. And I think it's great because that's exactly how my character, I think, would have responded. Yes. I just love that Dwight says he has soccer and clarinet practice. (laughs) Yes. And you know what? I feel like I feel like sometimes, I mean, you know, we have young children and sometimes when they're bad at lying, they they just sort of list what their activities are. So I sort of feel like like 
Dwight probably growing up had clarinet and soccer practice and he just went to default. Also, as Dwight leaves, he says, see you Monday, Michael. Casual Friday tracker coming at you. No one's dressed casual. No, it's clearly a Friday because he says, see you Monday. Mm -hmm. None of us are dressed casually, even though we're going to a barbecue after work. Well, people are going to change clothes. Don't you think they're going to go home and freshen up? I don't want to. Re- Listen, it's still not casual Friday. I get it. I we get it. We still set up in a previous episode that we have casual Fridays. And yet here it is, a Friday, and none of us are dressed casually. No, you're right. You're right. I'm going to stay on this. Okay. I, I think you stay don't on it. Don't worry, everybody. Don't. I'm on it. <laughs> that I'm on the, the mail, mail cart. cart. <laughs> I'm on casual Friday. <laughs> and we will continue to track Mindy's hair Don't anyone lose sleep over it. We're on it. Oh, I am, as you know, obsessed with Mindy's hair. I'm obsessed. I have one thing to say before we go to the party. Yeah. And again, this was like the the Sadiq moment in the cold open for me. It's something I thought probably way too much about. Wouldn't Jim have known that Michael saw the Evite? This is the day he gets access to everyone's emails. Jim clearly sent it to everyone's work email. Yeah. Wouldn't he have known? He knows Michael knows, right? Well, he knows Michael knows, by the way, Michael is behaving. But you're saying as soon as As he got access to the emails, the first thought Jim would have would be, oh, no. The Evite's there. The Evite's sitting in everyone's email. He's going to know. Well, similarly... How did we get all the way to the day of the party before Dwight thinks to mention the party to Michael? There's that scene where Dwight starts bringing up the party and Jim shushes him. And he's like, Shh, no, 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 don't say anything. Mm-hmm. You're telling me, I mean, when did he send out the e-fight? At least a week ago. In that whole week, he didn't have to like that keep did- the shush on Dwight? No, that didn't bump me as much because I feel like, I don't know. I know. I feel like, listen, guys, this isn't all dudes, but I know from my experience with fellas, they probably aren't going to think about the party till the day of, you know, they're not like, it's not like Dwight is like thinking about this party every day. He's got, you know, he's busy. He's He's busy. He's managing a secret relationship with Angela. Yeah. He's tracking yeast infections in Scranton. Yeah. He's got a lot going on. He's got a lot going on. All right. Fair enough. All right, guys, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to a party, a barbecue at Jim's house. We're going to tell you all about it. Are you ready or do you want to lay those out? Do you want to lay them out? I don't want to rush you. She's back. (laughs) She got some food and the sass is back. You guys, before we went to break, Jenna was getting a little lightheaded because she was really hungry. Yeah. So if you notice a tonal shift in this last part of the podcast, it's because we took an actual break during our break. And we ate a full lunch. We ate. Jenna and I eat lunch together. And it kind of reminds me of how we had lunch every day on the set of the office. I know. I love it so much. I was just talking to Lee last night where I said, well, he asked me a question. He was watching the episode with me. And he said, what's it like for you to watch these episodes again? Does it bring you back? And I said, it really, the flood of memories that come back to me. And the most prevalent is how much we laughed together as a cast And I said, and now I do this podcast with Angela, and we laugh the same way when we do the podcast and when we edit the podcast, and we eat lunch the same way, and now I'm tearing up (laughs) because we just had one of our lunches. Yeah, that lunch in particular, Jenna. Was a good one. Was a good one, and it really reminded me, we navigated nine years of our lives. A lot happened to both of us, and we shared a lot at lunch. And some days it was just little tiny things. And then some days we had huge heart-to-hearts. And Jenna and I just now had a really pretty big heart-to-heart. Those lunches were like, sometimes they're like a therapy session. They're They're better than a therapy session because it's your BFF. It's your BFF. That's right. All right. Well, we're back, guys. We're full of food. Okay. Um, And I'm going to start with a fan question. Do it. How about that? From Rob Fish. Okay. He says, whose house was used for Jim's barbecue? Because that's right. We're go to this barbecue at Jim's house. So for the house, we shot in a real neighborhood in Northern California. It wasn't a set. And we had to have really unusual shooting hours because it was a night shoot. And there was really nighttime outside of the windows. 
So we usually would shoot from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. when we were shooting at Dunder Mifflin. But here we were really shooting more in the evening. Mm -hmm. Now, they, if they were shooting into the house, it didn't matter what was outside. They could black out the windows. But for all those shots outside, it was really night. And some nights we stayed past 10 p.m. And do you remember we'd get a little bit tired? Yeah. We'd get a little loopy as of 9 p.m. And this was the first time where we shot offset, like really offset since the Dundies. And we always had a lot of fun when we would do that. Yeah. And also, I remember there wasn't really like a place between scenes for you to go. No. And I don't remember our trailers being there. No, I think they couldn't park them in the neighborhood. They were far away, so they would shuttle us in. And so in between scenes, we just really all hung out. Kind of In that like, little living room, kind of. Totally. This leads me to a fan question by Rufio. He said, when you had to go to the bathroom, did you use the actual bathroom in the house or did you go off set? I don't remember, but I because a lot of times you shoot in houses and they'll they'll tape the toilet closed and put a little sign on it and it says do not use and you have to go outside. They have like those porta potty things outside, or they'll rent the house next door and that becomes a holding area for everyone. Yeah, and maybe you can pee in the holding house. I I peed in John and Jim's house. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, I don't remember the toilet being taped shut. I I remember them saying that I could go. And I, like, you know, quickly, I used, there was like a hall bathroom or something. Well, sometimes they would let cast members use the bathrooms in the house, but then they would have porta potties for the crew, which I always thought was kind of lousy. Well, I know one time it was explained to me by an AD because I was like, well, wait, where's the bathroom everyone's using? And she said to me that um, they could not afford for us to go too far away. Oh, that makes sense. And so they often would have a bathroom for the actors a little bit closer. Yeah. Just purely because of timing. Yeah. So so just know that so you, you don't feel so I don't as feel so bad. guilty. Yeah. But it's true. Like you said, our actual trailers were probably a 15-minute van right away. So they had to create a way for us to go to the bathroom that was a little closer to the set. <laughs> all right. So when we all get to the party, Jim takes everyone on a tour of his house. Before we go on the tour. Just tell me. There is something that I just love little things like this. Did you notice everyone's party attire? Wait, I, yes, I have that here too. Can we talk about everyone's casual clothes? Yes. Meredith is dressed like a, a biker gal with like a smoky eye. I have a whole card just for Meredith. Okay. Okay, she has a denim vest. She has a black V-neck. Shows a little bit of midriff. Yeah. Her hair is half up, half down. Oh boy. She has some very dark smoky eyeliner. And jeans. She she looks a little bit like she's ready to go party. It is such a striking difference, I thought, of everybody's, the difference between everybody's casual outfit and their work outfit. The most striking is Meredith. Mm -hmm. For sure. Like, because she wears like corduroy jumpers. Oh, yeah. She to the like, office. She dresses kind of like a Raggedy Ann doll. She looks like she's in a potato sack and her hair down, but clearly party Meredith yeah. comes to play. <laughs> She does. What about Kevin's hat? Oh, his black. Is it like a fedora hat? It's, is it? What is that called? Like, is that, it's not a fedora, but it's like a, right? He looks like an old timey, like gangster in like a 1920s movie, right? And he wears it all the time when he's in his band. Yeah, he does. Scrantonicity. That, yeah, this is clearly, uh, you know, casually. Kevin has his hat. His go-to look. And Kevin's fiance's there, too. Our oh, yes. A lot of Stacey. people asked, who's the blonde woman at the party? Who's the blonde woman at the party? It's Stacy. Stacy. It's Kevin's fiance. And also, you notice Stanley's wife is there as well. Mm -hmm. She's the brunette woman sitting on the couch next to Stanley. Yes. All right. What about the fact that Phyllis is still dressed in purple? Yes. She, she only wears plum purple. She's very committed Lavender. to that. What about the fact that Dwight has on Birkenstocks and says that he keeps an extra pair in his car? Yeah, that's interesting. What? They look very new. Look when we, I notice it's a, it's an important thing that we establish the shoes that both you and Dwight are wearing in this episode. Later on, you're going to be at the barbecue mm -hmm. with Jim, and you're going to complain about getting sap on your shoe. I just have so much to complain about. I stepped well, in sap. I'm a vegetarian. But the whole reason they had to write the line that you stepped in sap is so that we can pan down to your shoes because 
making sure we know what shoes you guys are each wearing is going to become very important later. It is. It is. Paul Feig said, are you ready to bump some Birkenstocks? Hey! (laughs) Bumping Birkenstocks. That's right. All right, so I want to talk about Jim taking everyone on the tour of his house. Okay. He's so excited Pam has arrived. She doesn't even have her coat off, and he's ready to take her on this tour. And as they're walking down the hallway, um, first of all, just a side note, as they're walking down the hallway, Jim has a painted circular saw hanging on his wall. Mm-hmm. That's popular. I mean, I have, my mom has a painted circular saw. My grandfather was really into that. And we have a few saws that are painted. Well, I, okay, I have seen the long saws painted, Uh sort of like a long landscape, Uh but I have so many questions about that. I I have. Is that popular on the East Coast? Because, you know, being from Missouri and spending a lot of time in Lake Ozark, I've seen plenty of painted saws. But I just wasn't sure where Jim in Scranton, Pennsylvania got that item. Maybe it was a hand-me-down from a family member because I was given a painted circular saw. Okay. And I had it in my hallway. Okay. And I hung it myself. I sort of like, um, I sort of balanced it on two nails. Yeah. And I had a friend who like was like kind of clumping through my hallway and it fell off. Oh, dear. And they were like, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> Because I kind of I I didn't do a great job hanging it, but um, there you go. So, well, yeah, I, I thought that. it was very interesting. So yeah. you can check that out, people who like things in the background. Yeah. So anyway, as they're walking up the steps after they've passed by the saw, uh, Ryan asks if Katie is coming, and this is when we learn that Jim and Katie aren't dating anymore. He said, "I haven't talked to her in a while." I know, but fan question from Christina Velladotta. Ryan asks about Katie. Jim says he hasn't talked to her in a while, so it sounds like they've broken up, but then she's on booze cruise. Well, I think they're on again, off again, because then Ryan in the same conversation says, do you mind if I ask her out? And Jim goes, eh, maybe we won't talk about that right here, right? He says something oh, like that. Right. So he kind of skirts around the issue. Yeah. But he, it, to me, that answer is no, Ryan, like, don't call her. Like, I, he didn't say, sure, man, go ahead. Well, when I heard him say that, I interpreted that as being him trying to just protect Katie from Ryan. He might not, have. Not like I have such strong feelings for her that I don't want you to call her, but more like, um, no, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I read it as like, uh, yeah, I don't really know what's going on there. And I don't really want to talk about it in front of Pam, but I certainly don't want you asking her out. Okay. I buy that. Okay. All right, so also here's another fan question, this time from Latimania, who we have heard from before. And by the way, I did look at Latimania's Insta page, mm-hmm. and she does amazing fan art of The Office. Oh, I'll check so it out. I'm just going to give a shout out. Guys, go check out Latimania for some amazing Office fan art. How do you she, spell that, Latimania? It's L-A-D-A-M-A-N-I-A. Okay, we'll check it out. Okay. She asked, why does Jim have two of the same poster in his place? This was such a good find. Okay, so around 13 minutes, 14 seconds, after the circular saw, Uh they pass by just a pretty generic looking kind of framed poster picture on the wall. When they get up to Jim's bedroom, the same picture is hanging above one of his bookshelves. Clearly, as we've mentioned, we were on a budget and we ran out of decor. I think they just moved it when they, they shot it. They moved it. it. Yeah. I think they moved it, which I think is very, very There might funny. have been something on the wall they need to cover. Okay, so at this point in the show, we cut from the party back to... The improv class. Yes, and we're going to see Michael in the improv class for the first time. It's real. He wasn't lying. He really has to go to his improv class. And this is when you find out... That Michael just gets out a gun and shoots everybody in every scene he does. Yeah. It's brilliant. He's the worst. He's the, the worst. worst person to improvise with. And he thinks he's hilarious. And the scene when the teacher says, Michael, mm-hmm. I want you to give me all the guns you have. Yeah. <laughs> is so great. I tried to reach out to Michael Naughton because I, I did a sketch show with him years ago called Balls Out. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and he is such a funny guy. And I, and he played the teacher, right? He played the teacher, yeah. Chris. He performs at the Groundlings. You can see him there if you're in Los Angeles. He's, he's also done tons of episodes of Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. He's so you a, might recognize him He's from a other hilarious things. actor, yeah. but he's currently main stage company at the Groundlings as well. 
I wonder if people at home understand the genius satire of this improv class. Like, as an improviser, were you just dying when you were watching this? I wanted to be in the improv class. I know it wouldn't track for my character, but I was like, oh. (laughs) And I knew a bunch of those people, and they're such funny, funny people. So now we go back to the party for the scene. The scene. Pam is alone in Jim's bedroom. I have so much to say about this because the preparation that went in to any scene with Jim and Pam, it would bring production to a halt. It it really would. They were so concerned about getting these scenes right when Jim and I would have to get in a fight or if we had to have these moments up on the roof in this bedroom and we would spend so much time on these. So it's true. As a cast member, I'm so sorry. (laughs) When we would see that there was a big pivotal Jim and Pam scene, we'd be like, oh God, are you before it or after it? (laughs) Oh no. I feel like Phyllis would bring in all of her bills to pay. She'd be like, I'm bringing, I need stuff to do. (laughs) Buckle in. We're going to be here a while. (laughs) Because they're going to just really indulge. Once I became a mom, I didn't mind it. When I saw you guys had a big scene, I'd be like, ooh, that means I'm going to go visit my daughter at preschool. (laughs) Yeah. You'd be like, can I leave? Can I come back to three hours? (laughs) I have a three hour break. Well, just know that we, it was always so important to us to get it right. And, um, I remember having long conversations about this scene. So the words that are written in this scene are of no importance. We discussed that what was important was the everything we're not saying, the subtext of the scene. This is all about Pam being in Jim's bedroom and sitting on his bed. We had to make sure that we very naturally found a way for Pam to sit on his bed. And she couldn't just walk in the room and sit on the bed. So she had to start by sitting on his night table, and then we had to put the yearbook in exactly the right place so that when she went to grab it, she would most naturally then sit on his bed. And as I was watching this, it brought me back to all of those moments early on in dating and in college or whatever when you walk into that person's bedroom for the first time. And you've thought about it for a long time. You've thought about it like, where do they sleep? What does that look like? This is their most intimate room in their house. And, And John is so perfect. If you notice, as soon as Pam sits down on the bed, John starts shifting in his desk chair. And he looks at her and he immediately looks away. Like the fact that she's just sat on his bed. It's almost too much for him. Not only is this woman he's in love with in his room, but now she is in this intimate place Mm -hmm. where she's sitting across from him on his bed as he has probably hoped and thought about for a long, long time. And here's what I love about our show. And I think that this is why people are in love with Jim and Pam and why they respond to them so well is because a lot of times in movies and television shows, when people quote unquote fall in love or you have the couple that is going to fall in love, it seems to kind of be like a lot about sex, right? Mm -hmm. Like they meet at a bar and then they burst through the door ripping each other's clothes off. That never happens really, right? Like that's not really real. Jim and Pam, this moment of them just being in this bedroom not kissing, not touching, not talking about this stolen moment is more romantic and sexy than that burst through the door ripping each other's clothes off, in my opinion. Well, the stakes are so high. And that's that's real life. When you really like someone, it's like you can feel your heart beating out of your chest the first time you see a part of them that you've wondered about, mm-hmm. their space and where they live. Well, I wrote to break up this beautiful moment, please. (laughs) When Pam is looking at Jim's yearbook while sitting on his bed, Jim gazes lovingly at her. In this moment, you can see my character's purse on the bed. What? (laughs) My character (laughs) always carried this little black clutch, Uh uh-huh. you know, and it's there on the bed with like a coat. That's what I love too. It's like, it's that thing you go into someone's house when you're in college or even in your twenties starting out, you're like, oh, you know, you go to a party. There's that one guest room or where you throw your coat on the bed. Where you throw your coat. There's some coats and my purse. I thought it was such a nice touch. I, oh, I love that. Look for the little black 
clutch. That's my purse, Angela Martin's purse. That's a great detail. Well, I remember in addition to the scene, they spent a lot of time planning Jim's bedroom because it was going to be very revealing. And so our set decorator, Michael Gallenberg, he's our set designer, he was in charge of decorating this room under the direction of Paul Feig and Greg Daniels and Jen Salata, who wrote the episode. Fan question, Ricky Caden or Cadden and Zach McCutcheon both wrote in separately how much of the stuff in Jim's room was actually John Krasinski's. None. None. Except, fan question from Lulu, Katrina, Michael Kemper, and many others, was that really John Krasinski's yearbook photo? Yes. Yes. Not his yearbook. They made a fake yearbook page where they superimposed his actual yearbook photo. But there's a lot of interesting stuff in that room. All right, background folks. There's a lot of wonderful little nuggets in Jim's room. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you noticed. I know I'm probably going to have missed some, but here are some. He has a guitar. Of course he does. Okay, of course he does, but why of course? I don't know. Have we ever seen him play a guitar? I don't know, but I feel like all the guys that I thought were cool in my 20s had a guitar. Well, I get that. they hardly even played. Well, a fan, Kelsey VZ7, pointed out that in a later episode, you you know when um, Jim is playing Second Life? Mm -hmm. His avatar has a guitar slung over his shoulder. So there's something in Jim that either wishes he played guitar or thought it was cool to play or... But he's we never see him play it, right? No. no Correct us, guys, if we're wrong. I don't think we ever see Jim bust out a guitar. And he never takes the stage with Scrantonicity. No. So. No. There's a lava lamp. Uh-huh. Um, there's the favor poster. Um, on his bulletin board, I, oh, want, boy. I, okay, I want you to know, we hadn't even released an episode yet. A fan wrote in to me and said... Look at Jim's bulletin board. Is that a voodoo doll of Roy? Yes, he has a doll hanging by a noose Mm -hmm. in what looks like a warehouse shirt. This is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. We had another fan write in, Alston Brown, who said, was Jim the Scranton Strangler? (laughs) This was uh, perhaps evidence. Yes, What is that? Now, listen, I reached out to Michael Gallenberg to ask him about that. He's on vacation. He's on vacation. We'll we'll have to get it as a follow-up question. We will, because I would love to find out who put that on the cork board. Yeah, we'll we'll have to put that in our candy bag. Yeah. Also, there's like a some kind of sketch of a motorcycle. It looks like a printout. Like what does does Jim Jim is starting to sound a little bit like a cliche. <laughs> he has a guitar. <laughs> he has maybe a motorcycle he wants. Who knows? Um, there's also, it looks like a card. It says son, like maybe his parents. Aw. I know. Did you see that? It was so sweet. There's some photos. There is a a little like plaque that says making sense. Okay. What? There's a penguin on his desk. I do love when you pan across over to Pam, you see his CD player. These are the, the tech oh, moments yeah. that tech moments that kind of date us. And then he does take work home a little bit because there's a Dunder Mifflin catalog on his desk. Wow. That's good stuff. And I'm sure there's more I missed. So you guys write in. So now we go back downstairs to the party. Party's going. Everyone's having beer. Now, Omi, who played the IT guy, who's also at the party, he gave an interview where he said that we were drinking real beer. I don't remember that. And I wrote it on a card, Jenna. I did not drink real beer. I I didn't either. Well, I hate beer. So I had a beer bottle filled with water. So I, I don't remember that either. Yeah, I don't remember any real beer. No. That, yeah. would, that feels like it would be unusual for our group. Yeah. We weren't that kind of group. I had water. I know that. Okay. And my beer. All right. And, and that's why I said, well, Jesus drank wine. You know, I'm sort of trying to justify it, I guess. Mm. But mine was water. Yeah. He did also say in the same interview that they were playing the Xbox 360, and it had games that hadn't been released yet. I remember that. The guys were so excited. They were so excited. That I do remember, but the beer, I don't remember. Okay, did you notice in the kitchen scene Mm -hmm. with Kelly, Oscar, and Stanley, where they're talking about paper, I can see it. Kelly's hair is half up, half down. But she's still in a paisley top. But she is more Mindy. She's like... Oh, she's 100% have... Mindy. She's now fully Mindy, but... She is. Her wardrobe hasn't caught up. Okay, I feel like at this point, her hair has become unfussed. 
it's, you know, we're not doing that anymore. But now I kind of want to start tracking her wardrobe. Okay, Jenna. Okay, because I, I feel like the hair has come down now enough times. I want to see when the wardrobe changes. There is also a scene during the party that I love because it's just one of these things I love about our show. What? Is, is a runner. I love a runner that carries over multiple episodes for many years. And Kevin calls Ryan Fire Guy. Yes. You know? And yes. I just love that. It's stuck. I like that too. So when the karaoke machine gets going, Phyllis is singing karaoke. It was so sweet. Phyllis was so charming. Do you remember filming that? I do, and I wrote about it in my journal. You really journaled hard on this episode. <laughs> this was a big journal episode I for me. Guess so. Okay, I wrote this. Oh my gosh, when Phyllis had to do the karaoke scene, we were all losing it. We started laughing so hard. First of all, she had to sing White Snake's Here I Go Again. <laughs> And she had never even heard of White Snake. Oh my gosh. The production staff got her a copy of the song and she walked around for days listening to it and practicing. She was so cute and she was really nervous, but I thought she was brilliant. That is amazing. I love this image of Phyllis walking around listening to White Snake. Incidentally, that album was the first record album I ever bought, like actual record album as a teenager, was oh White Snake, and I would listen to it all the time. My first tape cassette I ever bought was REO Speedwagon. Heard oh. it from a friend who. <laughs> heard it from a friend who. Heard it from another friend. you've been messing around. Okay, we can't sing anymore. Okay, we can't sing. That. We can't pay for that. Also, no one wants to hear that. Also, no one wants to hear that. But imagine <laughs> sweet, adorable Phyllis walking around. Here I go, go again, again on my own. With like with like a headset on. Well, do you remember that um, music video? Oh, with the Tawny, scare? Tawny, was all over her name? the hood of the car. The redheaded lady, just yeah. crazy. She did the splits on a car, car on a muscle in a car. dress. Yeah. Okay. You know what? No judgment. Feel yourself. Do it. <laughs> Now, tell me, when do you go outside with Dwight? There's a moment where I slip outside, no one notices. And yeah. then if you're watching the scene inside, I'm in it on the couch. Yeah. Right? Well, when Michael crashes the party, you're inside, right? I'm inside. Yeah. That's right. And then all of a sudden, as the party gets going, you don't see me or Dwight. Well, this is what's a little curious for me, because Michael crashes the party and you're inside. Mm -hmm. And then he starts singing Islands a, in the Stream. A duet. Mm -hmm. Jim saves him, which is very charming. And then I just need to point out, by the way, Steve starts to harmonize like real well. I know. In that song. I know. It's really pretty great. But you I also want to point out that when he crashes the party, Jim and Pam are always sitting next to each other at the party. If they you track are. us, we're on some chairs, then we're on the couch together. We are making sure to maximize this party for, like, maximum next-to-each-other time. You're sitting next to each other. The other thing I noticed throughout the party is that Jim's roommate and his girlfriend are all over each other. They're constantly making out. They're making out, or she's sitting on his lap, or she has a leg, like, over his leg. And to say, those two people did not know each other before they started filming. And I I mean, what is that job? How do you get, I mean, I would feel so shy if I was, that was my job. I was like, hi, nice to meet you. I guess we're just going to hang on to each other all day. For tonight while we shoot this thing. Back to the scene. Steve and John, as Jim and Michael, are harmonizing Islands in the Stream. And then in the background... We go over their shoulder and we slowly push in on Angela's feet and Dwight's feet bumping the Birkenstocks. All right. Let's break down this scene for a second. I have to tell you some behind the scenes. Okay. I have some fan questions as well. Well, ask Perhaps them. Perhaps they'll maybe, lead you in. Maybe they're part of my note cards. Well, this is not a fan question. This is a me question. What are you in? Is it a shed? Is it a doghouse? It seems too small to be a shed and too large to be a doghouse. What is it? It looked like a giant dollhouse that people would buy for their little girl. There was like a, a, a ramp of steps that went up to it. Okay. It, it looked like someone had bought this for their little girl to play in, like okay. a fancy dollhouse. Yeah. Well, Angela, I have a fan question now. A-Town and Nat Attack and Brooklyn Jade all want to know, was that really Rain and Angela making out or were they just random stunt people wearing the same <laughs> shoes? And if it was them... 
Did they talk? How did they make it not weird? I mean, yeah, I think we all just want to know. Okay, How okay. did that go down? All right. Okay. So, of course, it's weird. It's totally weird. It was Rain and I. We did not kiss, guys. We did not make out. In fact, it was really cold out in that dollhouse. So, I had on a big, thick coat. I had hand warmers. But they did want to see our Birkenstocks a bumping. It was a little tricky because we had to time it out perfectly. Mm -hmm. And we tried different positions of our feet. Here's the thing. Rain Wilson is 6'3". I am 5'1". So my feet did not hang out of the dollhouse. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, if your bodies were positioned so that you could actually be kissing one another, we would never see your feet. No, no. (laughs) So we tried... Our feet in a few different positions so the camera could see them both. We were laying side by side, kind of flipping our feet back and forth. And Paul Feig was like, you guys kind of look like you're doing a sad breaststroke swim or something. (laughs) He was like, I don't know what you're doing. It looks like you're swimming. So he was like, all right, how do I say this? This is somewhat awkward, Angela. But um, I think you need to lay on your back (laughs) and straddle rain. Like I was like, what? And he said, yeah. He said, I'd love to see... Your little feet wrap around his calves and rub back and forth. So in order for me to do this, you guys, my face was in his chest. For you to see my feet. Were you like suffocating? Kind of. I'm imagining, like, how are you breathing? Rain was also doing sort of like this painful kind of plank move. (laughs) So that (laughs) he he didn't crush me. So he didn't crush me so I could breathe. And then I was like, how do I wrap my feet? feet around his calf. It's kind of awkward. You know why? Your ankles don't bend that way. Your shins don't bend that way. So I was doing this weird on action. Rain would roll over on top of me, do his weird plank move. Like in in one take, it kind of took a long time and he started to shake a little. Oh dear. All I will say is, Rain, you're a very strong guy, but planking (laughs) does take a toll on people. Take after take. We did a bunch of takes. Yeah. Also, my feet were like in this weird position. So we did this every take. And in between takes, we would roll on our backs side by side. We would have these really deep conversations. Mm. It was just one of those surreal moments where we were doing the most ridiculously silly thing. And then in between, we talked about like our lives. I feel like this is the moment where I really became friends with Rain because Mm -hmm. we talked about where we grew up and our childhoods and like what we believed in and just really had this really huge heart to heart in between (laughs) this plank (laughs) straddle foot rubbing of the calf. I did write about this in my journal as well. Okay. And I just said that I was really glad they weren't rolling sound out there. We weren't mic'd because I was giggling so much whenever we had to rub feet. Aw, so that kind of is the end of the episode. That ends the episode. There's a little tag uh, where we go back to the improv class. It's a little bit of a flashback. I think that they just loved this monologue, this talking head that Steve gives so much that they had to include it at the end of the episode. But I don't know if you remember this, Angela, that last night when we shot, we stayed till after midnight. It was a really late night. And um, I also wrote this in my journal. I said, um, Steve ordered pizzas for the cast and crew, and we all had like a little, a little bitty, like kind of, I guess, mini party after the party. He ordered Baroni's pizza. Yeah, his favorite. His favorite. It was so good. And that was, that was really cool. I love that we kept journals. We're women in our 30s journaling. (laughs) We were 80 when we were 30. (laughs) We're almost to our appropriate age. I think so. All right, guys. Thank you so much. We cannot wait. Next week is the Christmas episode, the first Christmas episode, and we have a lot to say. Yankee Swap. Thank you so much, Ken Jong. Joel McHale, not so much. Um, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Office Ladies. Office Ladies is produced by Earwolf, Jenna Fisher, and Angela Kinsey. Our producer is Cody Fisher. Our sound engineer is Sam Kiefer. And our theme song is Rubber Tree by Creed Bratton. For ad-free versions of the show and our bonus episodes, Candy Bag, go to stitcherpremium.com. For a free one-month trial of Stitcher Premium, use code OFFICE.